This meeting is being recorded. Ooh. E. Hello, we're going to be talking about path tracing today. Um, and we'll be reading through this. Um, Hmm. Yep. Yep. Path tracing is everywhere, including real time these days. Uh, yeah, this is the result of path tracing. It can look very good, though this image looks blown up because I think I zoomed in. I wonder if this, nope, that didn't matter. Doesn't this image look blurry to you guys? Yeah, a little bit. But it doesn't look path tracing blurry. It looks more like some encoding error. Uh, can you link the web page? I can, I can. Maybe, maybe it's just scaled up. Yeah. That's probably, yeah. Thanks. It may just be the specific processing they did on it makes it look weird to my eyes. Who knows? It's a JPEG on 720p. So yeah, it's entirely possible. Mm -hmm. Yep, could just be low res, and I have a high enough res monitor that I can. It feels wrong for some <laughs> reason. I don't know. I'm on a 4K monitor, so this is already at like 1440p size uh, onto my eyes. Anyways, um, Simulating physical light transport gives predictable and stable results regardless of the visual style of the scene. Hmm. So that's a good way to say why it's so popular. Materials gap. Yeah. So we're, this this ch this chapter seems to take everything into account. So that's going to be fun. Everything we've covered so far. I mean, <laughs> I appreciate the disclaimer because it is absolutely true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ray tracing. Yes, buzzwords. Ray tracing used to mean just one thing, and I just use it as a blanket term for using ray traversal to compute graphics stuff. Um, so but the graphics, yeah. <laughs> when when Witted did it, it was his own specific thing, and so you know, terminology is difficult. Especially when lots of people talk about it in different contexts and use the same, it's different but closely related, like um, game marketing and game development. Um. <laughs> Last week, when we were looking at the cameras and uh, lenses, uh, and, yeah, cameras and lenses, we had to look at some ray tracing diagrams that you'd see in optics. Oh, so that's another. Uh, Oh yeah, the there, term. there's plenty of domains that use ray tracing style algorithms for non-visual media because they're say they're, say they're doing radio research or using propagation of waves to compute sound dynamics. I don't know. There's so many ways you can use it that have little to do with the visual computer graphics industry, but uh, or little to do with it directly, I should say. Okay, so hopefully the definitions I know of are, are in line with them, with what, what the, the codex uses, but we'll find out if they aren't. Okay. Getting so, right into it. <laughs> yeah. So we cast array. I, I do appreciate the typing here. So, because we're, because this is all pseudocode, but it's math pseudocode, which doesn't have any sort of typing. So knowing, oh, well, this is a vector and this is a surface and 
the surface. And this is a watts over meters squared stir radians. So this is a power over stir radians. I appreciate having the types. The is it, Would you call this a type in a mathematical context? Uh, domain, maybe. It's domain. Yeah, domain, yeah, it's a domain. Thank you. Um. <laughs> There's a toggle for C++. Yeah, the C++ header actually made. Yeah. <laughs> I'll see it as a type. It's a G app. <laughs> <laughs> it's a gap. It's not yeah. that readable though, because every line has a comment. <laughs> yeah, and it, is it the same comments or nearly the same? Not. Doesn't look like it. Doesn't really have a one to one. Uh, at least the. Uh... The single letter variable names are commented. Yeah. Well, there's there's two functions. There's uh, compute the radiance. Is this is like compute the irradiance, and then path trace, which just calls the irradiance function over every pixel after setting up a camera, and we do it a number of times per pixel to get a and then average it out. So you know. You know what? I just side note, but like I'm used to for whatever reason adding up all of the irradiances, then dividing by k. But I forgot you totally can do it per. You can divide the number before you add it to the sum, like we're doing here. And that's probably better because it won't. If this is a if this adds up to a really large number. Um, then the divide my k might um, you might start clipping or something, especially if you have a lower bit rate per pixel. I remember writing something once where it kept an array for every pixel of all the samples, and and each time it wanted to <clears throat> do a uh, preview image, it would uh, uh, average over all of them. <laughs> it's the best thing in the world because it just got longer and longer and longer as you accumulated more samples. <laughs> so. Uh, what you call a, uh, a mistake. <laughs> e. So the we cast array. Uh, we invert the direction we're coming from. To get the outgoing direction, right? It's S squared. Yeah, because um, if we cast a ray from, say, the camera's origin towards a um, towards a point, and like say we hit a wall, the direction the light is traveling is towards the camera. So we need to invert it because this will be our outgoing direction since we compute everything in backwards, um, hence the bidirectional aspect. Uh, and then we do a scattering to figure out. Uh, it's just figure out whether we want to terminate or not. Mm. Yeah, and then we that okay scattering is happening down here, so I was jumping the gun. Yeah, Russian roulette is just like we have certain probability we don't want to continue. It's it's a little bit better than like doing just clamp at maybe ten iterations, for example. Oh, that's. Hmm. I hadn't considered how if you clamp out, if you just stop iterating after, say, 10 iterations, you get very deterministically wrong results because you're not bouncing enough times. Yeah, get, you, you, get, you get a biased result. Notice you, you rush, Russian roulette, this R, this probability is like used later. Like it is counted later. Trying to see where the, 
the source like, code is here. Like part of the PDF or something. It could very well be. Or I don't I don't see the computation here, but I do see it here, which is it's probably in the scatter. Yeah, so it's like it might fail to scatter. But here we have it distinctly, you know, computed that we're calculating the scattering of the PDF after we've um, returned if we're, yeah. And then we take the, is this emitted light plus the incoming light at the uh, incoming direction divided by weight divided by R and R is the probability, so. Yeah, so that's how we just don't have bias mm -hmm. even though we may terminate early. Yeah. I uh, uh, took a second to find this, but this is a good article on um, on Russian roulette, uh, Russian roulette. If you want to scroll mm. uh, uh, how to do it, it's like two thirds of the way down. Pause here. But yeah, it shows like how to <clears throat> how to compensate for it and stuff. Uh, so this algorithm doesn't like try to bias towards the lights or anything. My understanding is yes, because it randomly cuts off the um, bouncing. Yeah, but we don't have any important sampling or anything like that yet. Yeah. Okay. It's certainly not biased because we like we consider the fact we do that by like in land line 10, we considered we lost some energy. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. interesting. Nice little series of uh, articles. Yeah. Yeah, this is a good blog post or blog author. Mm -hmm. Who's the yeah. author? I'm just uh, distracted. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the blue noise guy. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's maybe. OK, maybe not. Um. Anyways. <laughs> so yeah. Something that's I don't think quite apparent with the uh, the mathematical definition is the uh, recursive nature of this. So, and then yeah, and then we we call li on the next ray. So. Is oh okay. Never mind. Uh, yeah. Hey, you're using a lambda. Nice. Okay, and then there's C plus plus boilerplate. So in the codex, Russian roulette probability was just some constant, but in the blog post, the probability was um, the maximum of the of the RGB value. So like, which one's more correct? I think or, they're both correct. If you <clears throat> account for the probability uh, in the output correctly, if that makes sense. So you have to boost the, the throughput of the array. I think it said that in the other, uh, in the thing JP linked. I mean, yeah. And then here we're having bo boosting as well here, I think. Dividing by the R here. Oh, I think that just means if you have oh. a constant uh, probability to terminate the ray, then you just use a constant throughput boost, uh, depending on. Well, I guess it depends on. Uh, yeah, because three fourths of the time the ray never passes through, so you need to divide by three fourths to boost I mean, if, the if next it looks, sample. It looks like, like in both, they just divide by the the generated right. probability. But so yeah, here it says the simplest implementation is just a constant, but 
um, in the link, it does not have a constant. Okay, I'm, I guess I'm asking like, what would be an incorrect way to implement the random probability? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just to not account for it uh, in the throughput boost correctly, I guess, would mean it's incorrect. I haven't tried uh, removing that compensation factor, but I'm, yeah, I'd actually kind of be curious to, to know what, what that changes. Considering I feel like I just learned about Russian roulette probability today, I have no clue. <laughs> um, because I'm using the approximation from that uh, casual shader toy path tracing thing and, and the one that I showed just a few minutes ago. <clears throat> I guess using a really small probability, um, yes, if, that will probably will convert really slowly, so. I mean, like it would converge really slowly, but it would still technically be unbiased and like still yeah. like the expected value is still correct, right? I think that's the idea, yeah. So this is a nice call out to the limitations of this this style of implementation, calling it pure because it doesn't allow for non area based lights, which is physically correct, but it turns out many in some aspects of life, a point source of light is an appropriate approximation, but it would not be energy conserving to have such a thing in this uh, rendering formula. Um, also, other effects are not uh, accounted for, like a perfectly smooth surface, but meh. No, we, we can't use BRDF for a perfectly smooth surface. That's a problem. Yeah, this <laughs> just three fourths, and then sphere random is our scattering function. So when when it says um, it won't render reflections and refractions unless the scatter function is at least a little sophisticated, what does that mean? Uh, of perfectly. Um, it probably is like a divide by zero kind of thing in the way it's been formulated, is my guess. Unless someone yeah. has a better answer. Yeah, basically if we if we use BRDF for for the like mirror, then we get divided by zero. Well, it's also you would never randomly hit the the perfect reflection direction, right? Yeah. So that's why it has to be more like, it's kind of like the one that we did where we had a special case for reflective stuff. <laughs> I guess with, with floating point, you have a discrete possibility of hitting it, but it's very small. Yeah, they are very close to zero. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, a simple version of scatter uh, can be fast and make the rest of the program slow. Is that because it's um, the noisy image, so you need many, many samples to get an accurate image? Or not to get it accurate, to get a good looking image? Because it's accurate considering the number of samples you've done. Uh, <laughs> it's just- Image that converges more quickly. Yes, that is a good way to put it. So would, would you put in biasing towards lights and stuff like that inside of scatter? Yes. Because um, you, you want to have samples that would m more likely contribute um, energy rather than not contribute energy. But that actu that is a biasing, so you have to account for that and or understand that it's a biased result and other things.
uh, am I understanding what it's talking about a better implementation of scatter? Is the implementation they provided like just pick a random point on the sphere kind of thing? I'm not quite sure. I'm not sure what their vector three random is. I don't know what evaluate finite density is. is oh, that's uh, the PDF, I guess. Yeah, and what I what I think it's doing is it's choosing a random point on the sphere, and then multiplying the PDB PDF at that point by whatever comes out here. So you'll get a very um, you might get some samples that have almost no contribution because it's in a it's in like the opposite direction of where the PDB would be, PDF would be, PDF. Yeah, PDF. Yeah, probability density function. Okay. PDF and PDB are both terms I use every day, and they're not um, the they're not probability density function. It's you know data pro program database and. PDF file format. Maybe not. Why do you use PDF file format every day? <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, maybe I'm uh, exaggerating a little bit there, but I, I have more times encountered PDFs during work than I have uh, uh, probability density functions. No, we certainly read a lot of PDF documents, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyways. So yeah, my, my understanding is we get a random point and then we weight how much that point contributes overall by the PDF rather than generating a random point in the PDF such that the random, I guess, vector, not point, the random vector is you're going to get a lot more ran, uh, vectors in the PDF than far away from it. That's my understanding of what that this thing was talking about. Absolute value of the top product. Yeah, basically, we don't do any kind of important sampling for materials. Right. But even then, would that actually be important sampling, or would that just be um, choosing samples in the PDF rather than multiplying it by the PDF? Choosing the sample through the PDF itself. Or, or is there's multiple types of important sampling? Is there now? Is my question. I think there's uh, multiple types. Yeah, there's, and that's okay. definitely one of them. Okay, good to know. Because you also want to be able to like uh, shoot rays towards stuff that actually is producing light, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can do important sampling for materials, and then we can do important sampling for lights, basically. I mean, it's still technically the same important sampling though, right? It's just... It's the same technique, but... Yeah. Yeah. So it's, what is important sampling? It's just you pick your samples with a different distribution and then you have to divide it by the PDF of that distribution. Is that all you have to do for important sampling? Yeah. It seems like you don't have to multiply times the PDF, right? If you're using it as the imp thing that's choosing the directions. I guess if you're using the, if the distribution you're using for the important sampling has the same PDF, then the dividing will cancel out that original multiplying. Well, so my, you don't have to do it anymore. My understanding of important sampling was that you choose rays in the directions that light might come from, not in in the PDF of the material that's the currently being hit. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that's a real bias is because there's no guarantee that light would come and reflect from that direction uh, in, in terms of the PDB, PDF. But that's possibly why there's multiple um, important sampling techniques, not multiple important sampling, which is another important sampling technique. <laughs> I 
my only problem with this nice description of uh, path tracing being such a nice algorithm is the comparison to merge sort. Does anyone like think merge sort is a cool algorithm? It's kind of cool. <laughs> sure. It's, uh, I think it's in like uh, cache friendly. Mm -hmm. They used to use it for uh, like you could sort stuff that didn't actually fit in memory. So it's like that's well, I I really like a cool algorithm. Yeah, I really like quick sort a lot better because it's more clever, yeah. if that makes sense. Because it's like it's assuming something about the data that isn't automatically assumed about the data. Mm -hmm. But the but, problem, quick sort has to actually touch all of the memory, you know, log n times. Every time you, oh, is that right? Well, you first partition it. Mm -hmm. So yes, you have to do a whole partition of the data, but the partition <clears throat> doesn't sort it. It just goes, well, if it's higher than this, this value or lower than this value, put it in one or the other half. And then you just repeat that over and over. Like we are a bit off topic. We are still yeah. recording, yeah. so, yeah. so sorry. yeah, we can yeah, we... talk random stuff later. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um... Okay. Um, I don't know if this is relevant, but I'm I'm on the Wikipedia article for unbiased rendering. And it talks about how um progressive photon mapping is biased, but it is provably consistent. The bias error goes to zero as samples go to infinity, and the probability of correctness goes to one. So then I'm, I'm not quite sure what, what makes it still biased if, so if, if you can prove it's still biased correct. Biased means uh, like, uh, if you just take one iteration, for example, on average, you will be very biased. But then if you take more and more iterations, the bias will become smaller and smaller. So, oh, good. So, oh, so you're case, saying like, like an unbiased render so is always unbiased, even like even if it's incorrect at like low samples. Yeah, uh, if, it, if it's on average incorrect in low samples, then it's biased. So I guess like a noisy, unbiased render isn't ever wrong. It's just missing a ton of data. <laughs> okay. Well, like it, 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 it won't have like a, a pixel that's like way too bright than it should be, I guess. Well, will it? I, I think it's more like if you take a thousand one sample per pixel or infinity one sample per pixel renders, you know, and then like average them, the unbiased one will converge to the correct result, whereas the biased one will not. Yeah. Well, it's well like, no, the, the Swift article says that that it will, like it, it will converge. No, that that's one render that has infinity samples for pixel, or uh, you said photon mapping. I, I don't know what it's, what the- uh, uh, It says pr progressive photon mapping. I'm not sure what that what that is. Well, whatever n is, let's say, assuming you generate one image where n equals one, let's say one sample, then it'll be biased. But if you take more samples, like you said, it becomes less biased. And I'm just saying, if you take several biased images and average them, it'll still be biased as opposed to one unbiased image, if that makes sense. So you're saying it's possible to average many low sample un unbiased images, but it's not possible to sample to, to, to average many low sample biased images. Well, that, that's just how I think of how uh, biasing works or like the thing you're saying. Okay. Where the uh, it's biased at low samples, but less so when there's more samples. My... my intuition is telling me to mention accuracy versus precision where in this diagram we have low accuracy but high precision if that makes sense oh wait no due to low okay well that's not helpful in this description what i'm thinking of is 
when in one situation, the unbiased rendering, the individual samples might be all over the place, but if you averaged them out, you would get the exact center. But with a biased one, if you took a bunch of individual samples, there might be some bias in some direction and you the average is wrong. Um, Yes, yes. But so I can't explain that mathematically. So it's kind of interesting, like biased, biased, uh, but biased but consistent algorithms. You need to take multiple samples together, otherwise, it is biased, basically. Yeah, I I feel like this topic has widespread implications in many things because it's uh, it's effectively just a statistical topic you know well maybe not the biased versus unbiased rendering specifically but um the this concept of yeah okay i th i see what you mean yeah anyways Oh, I think there is a recent article about that. I, I can find the link. Um, I think some of this chapter is like a, a rehash of previous chapters. So I'm not going to try to explain it or explore it too deeply. Yeah, the transport graph. I, I know they talked about that before. Yeah. It took me a second to understand what they meant, but it's just a, a, a gender neutral straw man argument or straw man algorithm. <laughs> I guess the thing that confused me about it is algorithm is not a person to me. So yeah. you normally say this as uh, calling it a naive algorithm, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I like the word naive better, yeah, but it's whatever. It's kind of meaning a little bit. Whatever. <laughs> Words are confusing, y'all. Oh, they have assignments. <clears throat> I didn't realize that. They uh, I linked to the the Ray's programming project there. Uh, it's uh, they have like homework. Is that ah. it? <laughs> I I like that. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a great <laughs> meme meme. <laughs> yeah, it's just in the first section. It talks about bias and consistency. Yeah, we can read that next week. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah, this whole thing. So, yeah, cool. Four hundred pages. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I thought you meant the this, not the Vegas thesis. Oh, I'm not his thesis. Yeah. Yeah, I. Uh, Some light reading. Yeah. <laughs> Do it right before you go to bed, kind of stuff. Well, I understand it's supposed to be pretty easy to follow. I guess for for that kind of thing, I don't know. It might be something we do in pieces. I feel yeah. like. All the early materials are usually easier to follow than latest materials, at least it's for popular. those latest materials that are not meant for teaching. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Nathan Reed finds it readable, which is a mark of praise. But it's also Nathan Reed who has some wonderful stuff, and I assume is very bright. So I kind of have to take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> yeah. Regardless, um, is this the thing where it's like it? chooses all paths from the light to the camera 
and that becomes very hard very quickly. Well, they say exponential algorithm, exponential time, if each ray branches. Oh, and yeah. And it's definitely. pretty bad because each uh, level in the tree um, contributes less than the higher level. So basically all of your rays are going to contribute nothing. <laughs> yeah. Is this missing an S here? All path tracing variant converge to a numerical solution? Mm -hmm. Yeah, variants. Infinite continuous transport graph. Yeah, that is a remarkable achievement. There's a... Uh... Yeah, there's a whole series of projects associated with the graphics codex. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. I guess this was a class. It's looking like, like a toilet at Williams College. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, so important sampling. We get a nice definition of it here. Eh. This feels like implementation detail, not algorithmic algorithmic yeah. uh, description. No, you want 20 minutes or two seconds. Fair, fair, but like the elements of path tracing as an algorithm, you know, starting from the I, uh, uh, well, there's yeah, some... five, five is also implementation details. <laughs> uh, some algorithms that are not as well suited for the GPU, so it is something that's fair that you have to take, uh, take into fair. consideration when you design the yeah. algorithm. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I, I guess ray accelerate, uh, ray traversal acceleration using hierarchy, you know, data structures. Uh, yeah, I can see that as an implementation detail, but it, it's its own complexity that that feeds into the overall algorithm. So, yeah, but yeah, this one I'm. I didn't un didn't realize the Markov chain model, chain Monte Carlo. Uh, you don't branch; you just have one or no uh, subsamples at each ray intersection. Hmm. Yeah, I learned Markov chain before. But yeah, but I I didn't realize there is a connection here. Yeah. That's some stuff with Markov chains. I'm just not really quite understanding what what the application here is. I guess likelihood of certain sequence of bounces or uh Oh, is it more general, I guess. Apparently. But um something I will say is Whereas Witten, the Witten ray tracing, um, oh, is there a link to it? Uh, I bet it's not freely available here. Oh, it is. I guess it's old enough. Um, this absolutely does cast uh, multiple rays in each direction. Like it, it assumes you're going to be splitting it, but at the time it kind of makes sense because if you hit a surface that like it's a glass surface and you want a refraction and a reflection, um, you cast both rays, like reflection and the refraction, 
and then you like you multiply the probability of what direction the ray would have gone in by the uh, contribution from the reflection and refraction. And for for limited number of samples per pixel, it's mostly a tractable problem, especially if you're not doing super accurate lighting and you just want ray tracing at all, uh, which makes sense in the 80s when you had hardware limited enough that you did you only wanted a couple of rays per pixel and you're okay with having hard shadows because you can't do the soft shadow computation. <laughs> uh, side note, but I wonder how they made those diagrams. Like not not the images, obviously, because they use algorithm for that, but like the the other diagrams above, because they probably didn't have LaTeX back then. Uh, I I feel like it's just some like drawing it's, script yeah. from this is a very simple or hand drawn. Nah, they're not hand drawn. They're okay. all like using a straight edge or a, some curve. Th these Control. kinds of things wouldn't be too hard to just write up some sort of math <clears throat> program, math okay. drawing program. Yeah, I mean, at that time, they had a lot of all these, uh, I don't know if you guys aren't old enough, but you remember asteroids and uh, that was a vector display. Vector stuff, yeah. Yeah, there was but, a lot yeah. of, so they probably had uh, plotters, right? You could draw stuff on a vector display and they had a plotter that would print it out. When did, when but, but there's variable line width, though. I'm like, if I were to bet, I would say it's <clears throat> You can uh, you can you can do that too with plotters. They they used to do plotters with switchable pens. Really? Yeah. Or just draw multiple lines close to each other. When was this released? They say eighty something. Okay. Yeah, LaTeX was in nineteen eighty four. So Graphics Codex says a. I think this nineteen eighty four. Kaiju nineteen eighty six. Yeah. Okay. Kajia is 1986. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's 84. It's 80. This was in 1980. Oh, wow. I, I'm really wanting to email Turner Witten if he's he's still around and ask him, how did you make those images? <laughs> the the <laughs> most... He, he's still around at least a few years ago. I don't know okay. now, but he was still around like in 2019. Okay. I feel like that's the least likely question he's been asked about his seminal paper. Yeah, the most interesting part of his research was how did you make these images? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I feel like that's an room. insult, a very disguised insult, and I kind of don't want to ask that now for that reason. Uh, I think he's gotten plenty of uh, praise for his algorithm. <laughs> Fair. To be honest. He'd probably be happy to answer it, but anyways. Um... <laughs> 43-year-old paper. <laughs> Uh, simple, elegant. Yeah, the, these last things are not discussed yet, and we may talk about them, or we may skip them, depending on how we feel. Uh, something more. Whoa, that's a dense sentence. That's very from what Oh, huh. so I guess yeah, you're, uh, yeah. Units of HDR image are joules, so it's it's actually collected energy. Huh. Oh. Because it's Oh yeah. And the uh the pixels aren't um really points like they are in rasterization. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I mean, they're not a point in rasterization either, but that's how they tend to be sampled. Right, the middle of the pixel. Have Have you seen that like famous Microsoft memo about how like pixels are not squares? A pixel, pixel, is, paper. Not a square. A pixel is not a little square. A pixel pixels are not squares times three. Yeah. <laughs> we, we've actually covered this. Um, yeah, we had a meeting. Oh. It was a very, it's a very good paper. Uh, honestly, can't recommend. 
it, it it's a crash course in image uh, processing. Yeah, I like the way it describes uh, yeah image problem. This is like a two D signal problem. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, that's um, something that's true about real world cameras is the exposure time matters a heck of a lot, uh, especially if you're doing um, film photography, because the film in the in the camera will have different uh, sensitivities to light. And so you have to be conscious of that to get good looking images, otherwise it might be over uh, under or overexposed. But when we're doing virtual rendering, we're doing instantaneous things and we're not taking into account, well, we're not, uh, we may be taking into account a unit of time in which the image is gathered, but it's not like obvious that we're doing that. That's an interesting way to think about it. Like it, this is a much, I think I'm thinking about this because I have been exposed to astrophotography where your exposure time might be measured in hours oh, yeah. and you you combine the images together, you know, a thousand or 10,000 images to get the actual output that you want, which all of the noise that is present in each individual image uh, turns to zero because well, it's noise. If it's perfectly uniform, then it should turn to zero um something they have to take uh care of with with those types of long exposures when the, you get into exposures yep. long they actually have to look at like heat causing noise oh yeah the side side tangent but the james webb space telescope has those giant reflector dish thingies at the bottom of it to reflect mm -hmm. the sunlight back at the sun and allow the machine the sensors to cool down to like five degrees kelvin or negative 265 celsius it's crazy that's not yeah. wait how how does how does it cool down to that cold space is, is very cold and so they just let the energy radiate away over the course of six months it's like those uh space blanket things um it's like sheets of mylar i think or something along those lines well, that, that keeps the sun from heating the, the telescope back up. Um, and they have active coolers probably. So they're like some sort of refrigerant that they um, pass through the sensor body. Hmm. Actually, no, that makes a little sense. Maybe, I don't know. I, I don't really know the engineering beyond what you find in pop science. Well, I, um, I don't really understand. Like how you can't like pump heat out. I mean, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Do, well, really, just like, uh, like how do you how do you like reflect it out how do you you don't reflect it out it radiates away due to black body radiation which you're doing right now you just can't see it because your eyes because uh, your black body temperature is well below um it's very much in the infrared um so uh black body radiation so the temperature oh wait is this it well, I think of like an infrared camera, right? Every, the objects are like producing yeah. low frequency light. Right, like the reason we call something red hot is because the hotter it gets, the, the it starts producing this color and this is well, the black I, body I mean, radiation. I, I know that like, away. are you saying if I have like a, like a, a hot shiny object in space, it'll eventually just cool down to like near zero Kelvin because it yep. just, it just radiates everything and it doesn't, and it reflects all incoming stuff. Well, if you <laughs> if you're also reflecting all the light incoming on it, yes. And and how fast would it radiate out? Well, it's it'd be exponential decay over time because it it will radiate a lot qu uh, at the very beginning, but the longer the colder you want it, the longer it take, because there's less energy to radiate away. I, I mean, five Kelvin seems pretty low. Yes, but space is very cold, as in it's also a vacuum, so there's. If it's cold, it, it can't be cold and a vacuum, though, right? No, it, it can be. 
It's just the average, the average temperature of the particles are like three Kelvin, though in the old, I don't know if that's true in the solar system. I just know in like um, the, the galaxy, it's, it's very cold, but even though there's only like five gas particles per cubic meter, they can still have an average temperature. Um, well, there's no air, right? Well, there's only temperature when there's air. Or I guess that just means that the density is so low that there will be basically no like diffusion uh, yeah. uh, that way. It's the different types of heat transfer are radiation um, trans and transmission, where like you you take heat from bumping into it. Um, and there's convection, but that's kind of just because of air moving around. So, eh. yeah, this was a big, big tangent. <laughs> I can't find the thing I was looking for, but <laughs> such a life. Uh. This is it's kind of dense there, yeah. Yeah, and it, it seems like this density turns into a nothing burger by reducing down to a uniform constant that you can multiply every pixel by. So that's fun. Gamma of the aperture. So. Is that what the hook looking thing is? I think it's capital gamma. <laughs> yeah. So it, so we we just pick a random point in the in the little pixel for our sampling location. Yet another tangent, but a good solution for that is uh, this one. Mm. <laughs> yep. Yeah, basically we're doing this. This is. This would be more accurate to a, a digital camera, or at least these top three. Maybe not this one, but like the digital camera does have discrete sensors. Oh, I guess if it's a. Never mind. I'm thinking about. Yeah, tangent. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, this link is posted every every week. That's a good article. <laughs> Hmm. That's an interesting description. Because we're doing an area on a surface. And we're doing it over. A... Or is this is this per pixel or across the entire image? I'm actually kind of confused what the X and Y refer to here. I mean, it's it's nice that they all collapse into a single n terms because we're doing uh, because they're not order dependent.
Yeah, this is what you were saying earlier. The if if you have a bunch of branches, you're you're adding way more rays that contribute up absolute no, nothing to almost nothing to the final image. So not diverging ray traversal is good. I mean, didn't the initial pseudocode have a em emissive term for every bounce? Well, but that's not a that's not a subsequent ray evaluation. That's a emissive term, which is constant to the material. It's like the light coming from this surface. I'm 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 not sure. What? That's well. That's what the emissive term refers to. Like we go all the way back up. Uh, we have the emissive term plus the li of the next ray. So this is the recursive. Um, what it's saying is by it, what it doesn't do is do plus li of one ray plus li of another ray plus li of a third ray that all stem from the, the one one hit point. But but it's possible for, for like an, another like recursive um, li to be brighter than well, n not if it's energy conserving, right? Ah, uh, maybe I'm missing something about what you're saying. I I guess like how I interpreted this this sentence is like. If you if you bounce to like n times, you might get a certain brightness. Then if you bounce n plus one, you might hit something emissive, and then the brightness will go up. So, but but it's saying that each level deeper into the graph is also darker. I mean, it's probably talking about something else. There's less uh, less energy can be kind of transmitted back to the the because um, less some is absorbed at each bounce kind of idea. Um. I'm going to switch to paint to draw what I'm thinking of because I think I need to draw it. So like with the branching, whatever, you have a bunch of divergence, divergent, you have a bunch of sub rays. But the thing is, is this ray is always going to contribute more than these two just because an energy conservation. This one can never be more than the, um, you know, the, these, uh, you know, these two, the sum of these two will always be equal to or less than the the amount coming out here. Like the the sum of the importance of of, of that ray on that final pixel in brightness. The, the importance. Well, I, I'm I'm trying to say is. Um, there is a certain amount here, let's just call it W, and we have X and w Y um, here, of, what, what and W will just... always be greater than or equal to X plus Y due to the material. Um, and of course, I guess if the material has so some emission, so there, there'd be a term here. Does this make sense to everyone? Is it, do people think I'm wrong? Are there others who see something wrong with my logic? OK, I think, I think that makes sense, yeah. The, the, the difference between here is each of these outer rays, where there's, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them here. But with um, path tracing, you'd have a bunch of individual rays like this of different length, you know, and then this one might be even further, but you have a bunch of them that might do this. All of these rays are the ones that are likely to, mo to contribute the most and they're the closest to the um, camera. 
so to speak. They're the first ray traversal. Rather than here, where you have eight of them out here where they could only at most contribute like one eighth, possibly, just because of the bounces along the way are going to be absorbing so much of the light energy along the path. And so that's one of the reasons why, or that's the description of why um, uh, not branching is superior. I mean, I, I think we're just talking about different units. Like you're saying, like contribution as like contribution contribution to the final result. Like, uh, like, like even a a black pixel can contribute like correctness to the final result. But I'm saying, like, like yeah. if there's no light added at the first or second bounces, then like those first two uh, rays, like those those first two rep, like depths, won't contribute any light. Right. Um, I, I guess I, I'm just thinking about it in terms of the dis distribution of individual ray traversals. Um, e e you want each ray traversal to be as impactful as possible. And all of these sub ones down here are always going to be very small compared to the very first bounce, because the very first bounce has the possibility of contributing everything that it can. But right, right. yeah, so... I think I, I understand what you're saying now, and I apologize for possibly talking over you because um, I didn't quite understand what you meant. No, so, sorry for the... Um... Eh, it's good to be... It's good for us to clarify uh, what we mean. Okay. Um... Oh, and the tri spectral stuff some at some point. I think that's cool. Yeah. When was this discussed? Spectral rendering. Uh yeah. I don't. I don't know if they're really good. Yeah. Because like, real light is not three RGB waves and only three RGB waves. It just happens that our eyes can really only detect R, G, and B wavelengths. So. Not that we actually detect only three exact wavelengths, but three ranges of wavelengths of differing strengths. So um, that's what they mean when they say like the those like shrimp can see fourteen different colors or whatever. Yeah. They just have differently distributed sensitivities. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting dis uh, distinction where. I think this is the same reference image. So it's like there's no noise in the original image. And um, monochromatic versus spectral noise is added to both. And I definitely like this one better than this one. Um, well, just looking at the you, images per se, uh, opinion wise. If you think about it, with the spectral, like when you're accumulating the samples of a spectral editor, you've got kind of another domain for noise to happen in because you, you're you're kind of trying to get an approximation of that, like across the spectrum kind of thing. Mm. So like, you've got another integral you've got to kind of think about there. So this is not just RGNB, you've got like, right, the whole thing. So, uh -huh. so, it, so it's saying it's like technically incorrect that, that like the RGB are sampled in, in the same like in the same rays, like kind of, yeah. RGB is a simplification, yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, right. it's it's three uh, three channel spectral rendering with an implicit um, conversion to the final RGB, where you do no conversion because it's the same thing, and you're not you're not taking ten different wavelengths and turning it into RGB. If that makes sense, so. So I it, is this like an implementation detail, or is this like an like a theoretical thing? Like, this is definitely theoretical. It's not just an implementation detail, um, but yeah. it, it kind of gets to how accurate do you want your results to be, and whether you have the performance budget to account, uh, allow for that. There's a reason to do um, spectral rendering, uh, especially things like um, 
uh, you want to model caustics that that kind of have the dispersion, like you see rainbows and stuff. Yeah. Okay. I I, I I want to separate the talk of this from spectral rendering. Just, just with only three channels, would uh, would sampling like would would generating unique rays for for each of the three channels be like less bias or like more physically correct than reusing the um, the rays for all three channels? Yeah, because the different wavelengths scatter not the same way when they reflect right. or refract. Uh, as you can see in that image that uh, Charles is showing. My, I, my understanding of spectral rendering was that you didn't have divergent rays for each wavelength or, or for each spectra, but rather you just have a whole bunch of, of components to your color channel or to your colors. So instead of just an RGB, you had a A, B, C, D, E, F, whatever, all I'm the way. I'm pretty sure you just, I, I think you also randomly select a wavelength that you're tracing that makes a lot of sense now that i think about it because you're at, you're absolutely right wavelength does affect how materials respond hmm. so a, a more accurate model includes the wavelength you're currently looking for I mean, looking I've, 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 I've seen both expensive. like bucketed and like individual frequency stuff right like that. i didn't realize it there were both i thought everything was bucketed together so, so that's news to me tracing Th there are different RGB. designs yeah right if you convert each, or if you treat each RGB component as like one, like spectral wavelength, then I guess it would be more accurate than a uh, normal quote unquote path tracing where it's like monochromatic, um, but it wouldn't be as accurate as like true spectral path tracing. Ooh. Um, so w w would you say that like the BRDF is depends on the wavelength, like in spectral rendering. Yeah, I think so. But it doesn't in like normal path tracing. I think yeah, you don't generally account for, okay. yeah, unless you're doing spectral, you're not really accounting for the wavelength. Yeah, because like wavelength dispersion, your um, diffraction index depends on the wavelength, right? Yeah, Which the is, index of refraction, yeah. It's, so what, that's why this requires spectral rendering. Right. Right. Interesting. I had never thought about that. Today it's, I learned. There's some really cool stuff on Shader Toy doing this kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm wondering if we should try to speed the rest of the article or put it for another week because we're, we're kind of getting long in the tooth for this, <laughs> this meeting. Uh, Either way. Whoa. Oh, so we have more discussion of the Russian roulette. I thinking about it, Russian roulette is a very accurate name for what's happening because you're randomly killing off rays. Mm -hmm. You're just like, nope. Not your, not today. Well, So it says it's correct for any definition of R that is a valid probability distribution function. So what is an invalid PDF? Um, so it's going to be based on your BRDF. I think so you're kind of like the idea is like the PDF is like how likely it's, it's a probability density function. So it's like the idea of how like how likely any given value is. Um, in this case, like how likely that that white path is to happen, kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or that, that combination of like in, input direction and output direction. Um, 
Yeah, so this is the the light emitted from a surface not reflected or refracted or any other other yeah. Um and here's a seems to be just the light over a sphere. Oh no, light over surface. Total power by that in all directions. So it seems like a simple model. Uh, the area of the light. Okay, yeah. Yeah. In entertainment scenes. That's an interesting name for things that aren't outside in daylight. Some non-standard phrasing going on. <laughs> yeah, the the problem with lighting or path tracing in scenes where there's only small lights, like an indoor, you know, scene with a couple of light bulbs, is those light bulbs only exist in a very small area of the of the world. So you have a very small chance of ever hitting it. And the smaller the light source, the less likely you're to get contribution from it. And that makes it much harder to get an accurate result because you have to have a lot more samples. This is the way like cutscenes in a game can be made to look better than uh, the actual game. So they add extra lights. You know? Oh yeah, lots more lights, and they can if they're doing any sort of TAA or other things, which I guess is, I guess these days a lot of cutscenes are rendered real time because they look good enough, but. Back in the day, you'd you'd up your texture sample count and other light uh, light counts, and just take a long time to render each frame, but then start to a disk and replay it on the user's computer. Yeah. Ah. Uh. Uh, is what is this? So we got the emitted light, indirect and direct. Wait, where is this indirect light coming from? I think this indirect is just, is just the the normal bouncing that we've been doing. Yeah, direct is sort that's, of the optimization. Like the, they are adding an uh, explicit <coughs> direct light term. Indirect is the previous original oh. term. Oh, I see. So if we only did indirect lighting, then it'd be unlikely we hit a light bulb, for instance. But if we also go, well, there's a light bulb in the scene. Let's trace a ray directly at the light. And if it doesn't hit something, we'll add it times whatever our contribution our, our probability of it hitting us would have been. This is, uh, they call it uh, nearest event estimation. Kind of yeah. Um, I mean, th this kind of looks like it's just sending another ray towards the light bulb. Like, so it is kind of forking off at each. Sort each of, round. but that, that ray doesn't continue. It's it's just yeah. occlusion check to the light. Can't it's, it's, uh, it's one depth only. So yeah, there are some splitting of rays going on, but it doesn't diverge recursively. OK. Um, but, but yeah, and then you have yeah shadow rays, I guess maybe what they're called. Oh, yeah. You're not. Yeah, OK. Uh, Like the, the one that the path tracer I've been working on is completely naive in that respect because uh, I don't have any nearest event estimation or anything like that. I'm still figuring that out. Uh, it converges a lot faster though if you if you do it that way. 
Yeah, this is the Witten style tracing because it has both a refracted and a reflected uh, after a primary ray. Whereas with a more path tracing style, you'd either go reflected or refracted. And then, you know, if you want, you just do a lot of primary rays and then average them out over time or over the number of samples. But like here in every primary and secondary ray, you would also add a, an additional shadow ray. Uh, yes. Yes, you also would do that because um, you also don't d depend on indirect lighting in the Witten model. You pretty much only have direct lighting. Um, yeah. But you do have a ray towards the light to detect whether you're hitting, it's going to hit it or not. And this is the the, the reason you have hard shadows is because you do not have any indirect lighting. It's, you still have indirect lighting in terms of refraction or refraction, just like you, you, you don't have hard shadow because you don't sample the lights. You, you only have point lights, basically. You don't sample the lights with multiple samples. Uh, yeah, actually, that's fair. So with a point light, you would oh, have yeah. hard shadows. Yeah, how does that work if, if like, the rest of this thing uh, depends on it being an area light? Well, with Witten style, you don't have area lights. You just have point lights. <laughs> but, I think um, there is an intermediate stage called, like, stochastic ray tracing, which does exactly that. It's not path tracing, but it's kind of, like, weighted, but it's sample lights with multiple rays. When um, when you're talking about uh, nearest event estimation with the with area lights, you're you're basically you're, you're picking a point on the light source uh, to do the occlusion check. So it's a random point on the light source. Mm. Okay, yeah, yeah. I want to look up this stochastic ray tracing. Thanks. I'm gonna read into that. Yeah, here we have an algorithm for important sampling. Uh. That's a lot of thing. So this is the, is this the spectral rendering you're, not spectral, um, st stochastic rendering you're referring to, Leslie? Is this the paper yeah. on it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see it's later than weighted, but like, uh, earlier than Kajia. Yeah. It's the next step in the process, or in the evolution, I could say. It's going to circle of confusion stuff for uh, the, well, I think this is actually talking about the thin lens model too. That's cool. Wait, this is an important sampling? What? Uh. <laughs> yeah. The best choice would be knowing what the light contribution would be ahead of time. But uh, <laughs> we don't, yeah. since we're calculating that. So, yeah. Mm.
Ah. Ah. That's nifty. Talking about spectral rendering without casting separate rays. Well, you could multiply each channel by how much weight it should get due to the wavelength they are being calculated at. Interesting. That's cheeky. And I think that's the end of it, unless people want to talk about something in more detail that I we looked at that we looked at. Yeah, this important sniffling stuff is still uh, a little bit beyond me. I'm uh, getting there. <laughs> Same. I think. Yeah, I want to understand that, and then I want to understand Reister after. Yeah, truth. Reister is so complicated. <laughs>